Welcome. We made it. How's it going, Nicholas? Great. What about you? Good, good. Nice to have you. Um, so welcome, everybody, to this very, very special AMA session about year-end closing with the finance expert, Nicholas Boucher. Uh, my name is Luke. Uh, I am the community lead for CFO Connect. So to start off, we will do a quick round of introductions. I will then ask Nicholas his three golden rules for year-end closing. We will then jump in to the AMA part of it. So please hold your questions for then. Um, and then we'll finish off with a nice little fun game. So as I said, uh, my name is Luke. Uh, I am the community lead, community lead for CFO Connect. And CFO Connect is a global community of more than 9,000 carefully selected finance leaders from fast growing companies and Fortune 500 companies as well. Around 75% of our members have a C-level role, and we really do our best to bring together experienced finance professionals to learn, exchange, and build meaningful connections through online, offline events like this one, resources like our blog, industry reports, and also tons of networking opportunities like member matching, private dinners, our Slack group, et cetera. It's free to join and you can apply uh, through the link that you'll see in the chat. Now behind CFO Connect is Spendesk. Spendesk is the complete spend management platform that gives you 100% visibility into company spend. You get a seven-in-one software with corporate cards, invoice payments, expense reimbursements, approvals, budgets, reporting, compliance, and pre-accounting in one simple scalable solution, which is designed to save time and money across your entire spending process. And this tool is especially useful, especially now with the current macroeconomic environment. Um, so definitely check it out. So that's my quick intro. I'll now pass it over to Nicholas to also give us a bit of background on where he comes from and why he's here. Yeah, thank you, Luke. So um, as you can hear, I'm French, actually half French, half uh, Belgian. I'm now in Germany since seven years working for a French group, uh, which is called Thales. Uh, I am a senior um, finance manager there working in controlling and uh, I did uh, also finance transformation. I also was uh, in charge of uh, the finance for one of our factory. And um, before that, I had seven years uh, experience at PwC in Luxembourg and Singapore. And uh, I studied also a bit uh, in the US uh, during uh, my, uh, uh, my business school. Uh, and why I'm here because um, I've actually uh, always loved to share uh, what I learned. I know here we have a lot of people in the group that don't have the opportunity to have coach or mentors. And that's why I share every day on LinkedIn what I learned and what I wish somebody would have told me uh, 10 or 15 years ago. And uh, we today, we, uh, we are in November. And I think one of the focus everybody has now is how are we going to finish the year? Yes, so a very, very great time to be having this AMA. We had over 800 people register for this event. So it's clearly something that the finance community needs and wants, especially at this time of the year, as they're a bit probably stressed um, with closing the books. Um, so um, without further ado, let's get straight into it. So before going into the AMA session part of it, Nicholas, I did want to ask you, what are your three golden rules when it comes to year in closing? Things that you must do in order to ensure success. Yeah, thank you, Alec. So first, um, in accounting, you have the main, one of the main principle is the accrual rule. And this rule st st says that you should record everything in the corresponding year. And in our balance sheet, we have a lot of positions, for example, in stocks that are maybe not anymore at the right value. And if you revalue that too late, then you'll have impact in the next years. And so you break this rule. So my first rule is to reassess all of your balance sheet positions that are significant. And inside that you have to review your assets. 
So your fixed assets, you are also intangible. So in, in fixed assets, you have the tangible and intangible assets. Uh, it could be that there is a machine that you don't use anymore. So there is no value anymore. So you need to impair it. Or that you have maybe a software or licenses that you don't use anymore and don't have market value anymore. Then you also have receivables from your clients. So here you need to do a review in case you have old receivables and you need to book a provision against this receivable if you think that you will not collect the, the receivable from your client. And all of that will have an impact on your PL, and you need to make sure that this impact is this year and not in the next years. On the, on the stocks as well, you need to review, is the stock that you have, is it still a valuable stock? Are you going to use it in the next uh, 12 months? Then on the liabilities side, you also need to review your provisions. In the provisions, uh, and we do that always at the end of the year, there is a huge part is the, the human resource provision. So how many uh, holidays were not taken? How many um, uh, hours need to be paid? What is the bonus provision? The bonus provision is one of the most complicated provision to do because you need to estimate what will be the financial results of the year because the bonus is calculated on these financial results. So that we work closely together with HR on these provisions. Then um, you also have all of the provisions for risks. Uh, you have litigation, uh, you have also warranty risk. So that uh, is better to do every quarter, but if you do it only once a year, you need at the end of the year to do it and to make sure that your risk is newly assessed and that you take the last information to update your provisions. So that's the first rule, review your balance sheet and make sure that any balance sheet movement, the impact is reflected in uh, your PL. The second one is more strategic and uh, operative with our departments, is how are you going to lend the year? So you are now in November, November is uh, finished. So we just arrived in December. Today is the 1st of December. Maybe some of you already closed November or you are doing it right now, but you have 11 months behind you. And the question is, okay, this 11 months is done. You cannot do anything, but what should you do for the last month? So you need to take the actuals that you have this uh, 11 months and estimate what happened the last month to calculate your lending scenario. And based on that, you will review what are the risks and opportunities to arrive to this scenario. And you will discuss with the management and with the other departments on, on what to do to reach this lending scenario. How do you make the opportunities happen? And how do you mitigate the risks? So this discussion is more strategic and you will be involved at different levels. It can be that you are only focused on sales uh, because your department is focused on sales. It can be that you are focused more on uh, some cost. But uh, this is where in finance, we have a huge role to play. And the last point is really concrete is cash. A lot of companies, they have their objectives linked also on the cash and on the cash flow they generate every year. So what can you do to collect the last pieces of cash from your customer? So there again, go through all of the, all of the invoices that are not paid or yet not sent. Uh, even though a lot of uh, terms and conditions say that you are between 30 days or 60 days. So it's maybe now too late to send the invoice to collect the cash, but maybe you can negotiate with your client. So there again, review and look at, uh, do a 80, 20 analysis, look at what are the main clients and the main invoice to work on to collect the cash before year end. So in summary, my three golden rules, review your balance sheet, then look at your lending scenario and what to do and what can you do with the operative departments to reach the lending scenario. And the last one, work on collecting the cash. 
Thank you, Nicholas, for, for starting us off with those uh, three very concrete points. Um, so yeah, so now um, on to the next session section of the, this uh, event is the, the fun part, the AMA part. So please, um, to all the viewers out there who are very interested and intrigued about this, this topic, please go ahead and start dropping in your questions um, so that Nicholas can, can take his time in the next 20 to 30, 25 minutes uh, to answer you uh, live on stream. Um, so please uh, go ahead and drop in your questions. So do we have any questions coming? So far, it looks like there are no questions in the Everybody's chat. Everybody's ready for year end. <laughs> yes. Um, but in the meantime, Nicholas, you can tell us again exactly, you know, what you're doing um, by sharing information every day and, uh, and why you do it um, as well. Yeah. So now I have a community of um, around 50,000 uh, people on LinkedIn. I have also a newsletter. And I started that first for me just to learn because each time you need to teach something, you need to learn it yourself. So I was, um, I was really uh, keen to learn a lot. And each time I learn something to share it because I think keeping something valuable for yourself is kind of uh, egoistic. So, and I'm doing that also. I did that always in my career and with friends. I always share tips. So if I learn something on Excel, I'm going to share it with my colleagues. I'm going to show it to my, um, to my friends because I know it will help uh, other people. And now I kind of uh, systematize that on LinkedIn. I have also a newsletter. And there is a great feedback from people because LinkedIn now is the first place you can get information and the information is pushed to you. It's not that you have to go to Google and search for something. You can really see on your feed the best uh, content from the, the people who have expertise. And what I also like about LinkedIn, there is a part of your knowledge that you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And sometimes on LinkedIn, somebody is going to talk about a concept and you are like, okay, so that exists. And then you are going to research about it. And uh, that's where also for me, it broadened all of my knowledge by talking to other experts and seeing in other industries, in other countries, how things are done in finance, also in marketing, in HR, in procurement. And uh, there is every, every day a lot of things to learn. And the last uh, months, actually, as people always ask me, help to grow them, to grow in their career, help to learn FPNA, help to learn controlling, I decided to summarize that in a course because I cannot answer to everybody. And uh, so I have also an online course that it's like a digital box, a digital toolbox with uh, around 80 videos. And uh, you can access uh, the videos at any time you want. It's a short video about specific topic. And um, in this course is basically uh, what I would like, have liked to have when I started my career 15 years ago. Cool. Thank you, Nicholas, for giving us a rundown of that. Um, I, very, very interesting. And so as you were speaking, there are now a few questions that, that have popped up. So we'll go with the first one. So from Moritz Mensel. So thank you, first of all, Moritz, for kicking us off and asking the first question. So the question is, any way to avoid ESOP provisions? Okay, here I have to, to play a bit dumb uh, to look what it means really by ESOP. Uh, provisions because like I said before in some industries in some countries some terminology is really specific so um, I will have to look uh, separately like what it means by the term ESOP okay then uh, let's let's roll down do you see any question that that you would like to answer um because there, there are now a few popping up yes yeah, so uh Pratik uh, Lozalka ask about cash. Yeah, I was referring about the cash flow. Uh, we always, for us, like uh, how much cash, cash in you can 
um, you can get. So yeah, how do you improve the cash flow of the year? And then we have Janice. How difficult was the process this year? Yeah, so uh, this year we have uh, a really specific year where actually since now, since COVID now, uh, where a lot of things are changing, assumptions are changing every month. Um, for example, if you take a project, a long-term project, how do you know what are the costs in the next three years when you don't know how the inflation will be? And so is this project going to stay profitable or not? And in accounting and uh, controlling and finance, if you see that a project is not going to be profitable anymore, you need to book straight away a loss. But the question is, which assumption do you take on inflation for this uh, project if inflation is changing every year? So there you need to review the way you work. Uh, you need to look at the last, last economic conditions. And uh, you need also to have a straight line because you need to have a method that you can explain in the next years and that you can follow. So um, for me, that was in the last six months, one of the most complicated area is how do you manage inflation and what do you plan for the coming years? Um, for Risper Uzo, how does the year end process differ for nonprofits? I think um, for nonprofit, you will more focus on having a clean financial statement, but you will not be absolutely driven by um, achieving the objectives. Uh, whereas in a profit profitable company, there is a lot of uh, pressure to achieve the profit and the results for the year. So I think this more, where do you put your focus? Uh, but we all, all the companies and all the organizations are still submitted to law and regulations and that is applying, uh, apply, applicable for everybody. And it looks like uh, Moritz also, he specified what he was talking about in terms of ESOP, um, virtual stock options for employees. Okay, Moritz. Okay. Yeah, so like I said at the beginning, for me, that's part of the, the bonus and provisions for um, what is linked to remunerations. Um, and as you are going to disclose this information also uh, to public, you need to make sure that uh, this is something um, that you have reviewed carefully. I myself, I don't have a lot of experience in that because I didn't work in companies where they were distributing a lot of, uh, of these stock options. Um, but I myself think that is part of the remuneration, remuneration linked also to the year, to the results, and uh, is to be treated like also a bonus. Uh, and there is a confidentiality part inside, so you need also to work with HR. You need to make sure that your model of calculation is correct because you don't want to have effect uh, in the next year if the bonus and the stocks are based on this year results. Cool, thank you. Um, I saw one um, that we can answer now is from Constantine uh, Batnari. That's, thank you, Constantine, for the, the question. Um, what is your favorite FP&A software? Excel. <laughs> for me, um, I think you should first make sure that you know your models, you know your budget, and you, that you can do it in Excel. Once you start to be in an organization where there are more people involved, more departments, um, where you have also more versions, then you can start to implement FPNA software where you have um, collaboration inside, you have cloud, you have versioning, and where um, it's easier to pull data from the past, pull data also from different departments. 
in comparison with Excel. But for a small structure, I will start first with Excel. And once the budget and the processes run well, then you can look at the existing FPNA software that exists based on the size of your company and based on what you want to do uh, within your organization. Because there is not only finance, there are actually, you need to plan people. So HR needs to be involved. You need to plan uh, manufacturing. So uh, production is involved and supply chain. You need to plan also your sales. So you have also CRM tools for that. So that's something you want to talk with other departments to make sure that you have the right tool for the company. And I'd be curious to know as well in the audience who still uses Excel versus um, a specific FPNA software. So if you want to let us know in the, in the chat, um, that'd be also super interesting. Um, in the meantime, do you have any other questions you see that uh, you'd like to, to answer now? Um, yeah, from Guy Joel de Lono, Lono. What is your recommended approach for budget? Zero-based or actual-based or hybrid? Um, I think if you want to be fast in a, in an environment that is not changing, you can take the actuals uh, from uh, last year and it's a good basis for your budget. If you are in an environment where you need to reduce cost, you need to find new ideas, you need to innovate, the zero-based budget is much better. It takes much more time but the objective is different. The objective is, okay, where can we find reduction of cost? And how do we make people find ideas? And for that, the zero-based budget is basically starting from scratch and from zero and checking what do we really need to achieve the business we want to run next year. So in the meantime, while you're answering that question, it looks like people are dropping in their answer to the question I had asked. And it looks like it's a lot of Excel out there. <laughs> a lot of Excel. Um, cool. Um, do you see any question? Maybe the one um, from Philip Ham? Yeah, it's a good one. OK, great. Yeah. So I will say, uh, Philip, uh, how do you collect data? Here, there is, um, it's like the, the triangle. Do you need the data fast? Do you need good quality? And uh, how many people are involved? If uh, you need something where you have a lot of people involved and you have time to set up a process, you need to find a way of having a tool to collect the data, so a collaboration tool, where people can enter the data uh, either in a SharePoint or in an Excel that everybody has access to, or there are a lot of solutions. If you have only one uh, people that you talk with, so only one, um, one person will send you the data, ask them first, what do they have at their disposal? Do they already have a file where the data you need is inside this file? Then ask them to have uh, to share the data with you because for them it will be easy and for you you'll have a possibility to have the same data that they use so less risk that they never send it less risk that you have other data than them and also you have normally the data quicker and maybe you get other data that you didn't think you need but by seeing that they exist you are going to make value out of it Great, thank you. Um, it looks like there's a question. I don't think I can see the name. It says LinkedIn user, but what are the key elements to reports um, to investors and associates? Oh, okay. That's uh, that's a really long list, and it's really depending on the first on the countries. Um, so I think here I will have to know okay which regulation, which uh, gap principles. Uh, that's the question is uh, too broad, uh, but basically you need to, there is a lot of common sense in the gaps. So if you think your investors need to know about something to understand the financial statements, then it should be there. So um, for example, if there is a litigation, normally you have to report that. Uh, if there is an error 
in last year accounts, you have to report that. So those kind of um, those kind of information, they are disclosed in the gap. They say what you have to do, uh, but it's basically it always is common sense. After there are some rules to show how to present some data in a certain ways. Great, thank you. Um, just a heads up, uh, there are about 10 minutes left um, for asking questions. So please, if you have any, uh, ask them now so that we can try to take as many as we can in the next 10 minutes um, because the session is flying by and uh, it will all, almost be over. Uh, so Nicholas, any other questions you see out there that you would like to, to answer? Um, checking. What software, what software are you using to help with closing process? I'm not using any software, but what is good practice to have is a checklist uh, to make sure that you don't forget anything and to make sure that everybody knows what they have to do. Also that everybody knows when they have to do, because there are some dependency in your closing process. And don't forget that people before Christmas they go on a holiday maybe earlier than plan. So always have that plan in your organization and your checklist. Because if on the, on the 29th of December, you need an information and the people are on holiday, it's too late. So plan that in your checklist and in your process. Thank you. Um, looks like there's a new one that just landed. Um, what are key improvement areas in a factory? Maybe that's not a, okay, it's an actual question. Yeah, um, I worked three years in finance um, for a factory. And the main impact to improve uh, our results was really to work um, on lean. So how do you make the, how do you make your product and your process linear? Because a lot of time we saw problems at the end of the product. Meaning that if you spend 100 hours to work on a product and the last five hours you notice that a piece is defect, so one of the, the part of the, of the product is defect, then the whole product might be uh, to scrap. But if this part that was defect will have been detected at the beginning in the next in the first 10 hours, then you will have only have spent 10 hours to scrap. So only the first 10 hours will have been scrapped and detecting that at the beginning is much um, time and cost uh, efficient as uh, doing that at the end. So that is one of the, the main factor is to make sure that to reduce the, the cost uh, of non-quality, that you work agile, you work lean, you, you do stop and fix, meaning that each time you see a problem, you don't let the production running uh, if they are still concerned with this problem. You stop, you first fix the problem, or you look at the problem, you see if others are involved, so other products and other, other line of products, and then you fix it before you start producing again. Because if not, there's a risk that everything you start producing after this problem will have the problem that you noticed and you'll need to also correct that. So those are principles. I'm not an expert, but I've seen that working. And, um, and at the end is where you can do a lot of cost savings. Because if you increase the quality of your product and you spend, that means you spend less time on it uh, in total, you spend less material, your production, your company will be more profitable. Cool, thank you. It looks like there's a nice question from uh, Callum McDonald. So thank you, Callum, for the question. What metrics do you find most valuable when evaluating the health of a small slash growing company? What is interesting is the small and growing. Because um, the risk when a company is growing fast is more a cash problem. Uh, why do I say cash? Because imagine, uh, imagine your clients are paying you within three months 
And now you have uh, to produce, you have to buy a lot of inventories. And when you buy the inventory, if you buy for the inventory in one year or two years, and you take into account the growth, the clients paying you instruments are not going to be enough to pay this inventory. So my main recommendation for small companies is always follow your cash and always have a cash planning because that's how a lot of small companies fail. It's not that they don't find clients. It's not that they have a problem of growth. They have a problem of cash. They cannot finance their growth and they forget to finance it because they are, uh, because they are small and growing. They have other business priorities. But there is a point where uh, the problem is too obvious and too late and then they might, uh, they might fail. So I will think first cash for small companies. And second also look at where you can um, streamline processes when you start to grow. But uh, first cash. Cool, thank you. It looks like there's a, now a few more questions that just popped, up, popped in. Um, are there any that, that catches your eye that you'd like to, to answer? Um, yeah, maybe a nice, nice question from Nada, Nada Tawani. Mm -hmm. um, how do you make sure that when you compare scenarios, you don't drown in the Excel files? Um, so at the end, your Excel needs to be able to react fast and to, uh, to be able to use it to explain to somebody who has no clue about the situation. So if you make it too complicated, you will have too many scenarios and nobody will understand the difference between scenario eight, nine, 10, 11. People, they, the brain of people, they mostly work in three. So either you have the normal scenario that everybody knows, and then you have something better or something worse. So try to always limit yourself to three, uh, three uh, possibilities. That's my first recommendation. Then when you limit yourself to three possibilities, make sure that everything that does not change is fixed in your model. And the rest is just depending on the scenario you have for each of these three possibilities. So let's say that in the worst scenario, if you have 20% less employees, then you should have directly an impact on the salary by 20%. So, but make sure that this is something connected and something you don't have to change manually. Each time somebody comes say, oh, it's not 20%, it's actually 30%. So that would be my main recommendation. And how can you anticipate? I would say, uh, first, if nobody is coming to you with a proposal, make a proposal yourself. And uh, like I said, the proposal should be something within a range of worst case and best case, and then choose in the middle uh, what is the most probably uh, scenario, most probable, probable scenario. Thank you, Nicholas. So time is starting to run a bit short, so we can take maybe one or two final questions um, before we wrap it up. Um, so yeah, please go ahead. And if there's any questions you think would be useful for the audience to answer, um, please go ahead. Yeah, there is one interesting question from Katerina Jakimowska. Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, KPIs for FP&A team? Um, one good KPI that uh, finance don't use enough is how far is your budget that you made uh, six months ago or one year ago compared to the actuals? And do you understand what did you do wrong in the budget or what you didn't know in the budget when you, um, when you computed your budget at the time? So you can compare and measure yourself for that. You can also measure yourself through um, a questionnaire. You can ask people every year, what do they think about the value you provide? What do they think about your contact and your relationship, your communication? And then you can compare year after year how these answers evolve uh, over the time. That's also a good way. 
And uh, maybe uh, one last point is uh, look at the time you spend on the activities. You start saying, okay, which activities are high value activities, which one are investment for the future, and which one are basically activities that are back office activities, which you could delegate or decrease or automate. You make at the beginning a, a view like that. And then every six months, you look, am I going to improve the high value activities? So that means you are improving yourself or is not it is not uh, changing. So that means like you didn't improve your team or is it in the contrary deteriorating? So look, assess yourself. Then every six months or every year, look if you are doing more of the high value activities or less. And that is a good way. That's a good way to uh, measure yourself in FPNA. Great. And so let's just let's take one more question um, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up um, for the for the AMA. Um, thoughts on introducing using machine yeah machine learning tools for finance. Mm. Um, I think one of the most advanced now uh, most advanced tool is on uh, accounts payable because a lot of uh, invoices are received every year from the companies from your suppliers. And sometimes one supplier can send you 10,000 invoices in a year. So how can you use machine learning to learn the invoice, to recognize on it what is the date, what is the purchase request, what is um, the amount in euro, what is the text, and how can you make the tool recognize that, that you don't need anymore a human coming between the invoice and your ERP. So that would be my first uh, recommendation. The second one is some businesses are high transaction businesses. Um, for example, uh, supermarkets or e-commerce. And those businesses already detect in the consumer behaviors or in the sales, some trends or some, uh, I would say uh, some effects that uh, they analyze and through machine learning, they will show you something that you didn't think about looking at. So they could say, okay, there is a weird connection there since uh, one week. Uh, if we tweak one of the marketing element, maybe we can make more uh, sales in this market. And if the amount of data is so big that a human cannot look at it, that's where you want to have machine learning tools. Cool. Thank, thank you, Nicholas. Um, so that will wrap it up for today's AMA session. I know time went by really fast and we still have some questions that we didn't get to. But if you guys found this useful, if you enjoyed um, Nicholas's AMA and content, we can definitely do this again in the future. Um, I think Nicholas hopefully will be happy to, to join us again. Um, and so as a reminder, uh, we will have a recording to share. We will also have a lot of a, a recap with um, all of the questions and answers from Nicholas. Um, and if you want more of this kind of content, of these kind of experiences, you can join CFO Connect. It's again, it's a free community for finance leaders. So, so please apply. Um, and yeah, you get access to all kinds of different um, events, uh, industry reports, as well as um, different ways to connect with your peers. Um, also, Nicholas, do you wanna just, I, I saw some questions from people asking how they can access your course, where to go. So please feel free to, to also um, give a quick uh, rundown of that. Yeah, so um, thank you, Luke. Um, so for my course, it's accessible on my uh, LinkedIn profile. So look under my, my picture, there is a link and just click on it, and then you have access uh, to the selling page. Uh, one information, maybe, uh, the price is going to change uh, next year. 
So uh, if you want to get it still at a cheaper price, uh, go ahead. Uh, it's the last months and the last weeks for that. Uh, also, my course is always, um, I'm always adding more stuff. Uh, and in the coming weeks, I'm going to add more content. So everybody who's buying now, they will get it as well. And what I just launched in the course is actually a community. Uh, so everybody who joined the course can access to, to the community and talk to the other students. Uh, so don't hesitate also, or drop me a message by LinkedIn if you have any question uh, on the course. Cool, thank you. And we are now going to also end with the more a fun exercise. So these are going to be some quick, rapid fire questions to Nicholas. You have about 15, 30 seconds to answer the questions, and that'll be a nice way to finish this off. So the first question was already answered, but we'll ask again anyways. What is your favorite FPNA tool? Excel. <laughs> okay, easy. Straight to the point. Um, next question. What's the book on your nightstand currently? Um, so I have one book that I'm listening to is um, The 100 Million Offer from Alex Hormozy, uh, which is a really great book to, to think about how to, to grow a business. And um, it's really practical, uh, actionable. So for anybody uh, who likes business like me, uh, I recommend it. And speaking of business, uh, what is your favorite business podcast? Uh, so I'm listening to My First Million. It's a podcast um, from Shanpar, uh, Sam, Sampar and Shanpuri. And it's two guys who already had a, a business life before. They grow businesses, they grow uh, e-commerce, they grow uh, startups. And now they look at the every business possibilities. So they dig the deep dive in one uh, type of industry and they, they exchange on how to make the best business out of that. And um, they're also quite fun. They also have guests. So it's a really po good podcast to know about what are the trends and also to get ideas. Cool. Um, as we know, um, right now, the World Cup is currently ongoing. Um, and it sounds like you have uh, a very multicultural background. So what is the team you uh, are currently uh, supporting? Well, I'm always behind France, <laughs> uh, but also Belgium because uh, I'm a half Belgian. So I still have, uh, I love if uh, Belgium goes uh, also is successful. But if there is a game France, Belgium, I will have to go for, for France. And, uh, that makes sense. What I did yesterday is I bought this uh, Panini uh, stickers album. Uh, mm -hmm. And now I'm showing my daughter. She's only five, but uh, I'm sharing uh, this thing that I was doing when I was a kid. And uh, we opened together the stickers and uh, I'm explaining who are the players. Uh, and what is good actually is for her is to know that there are other countries in the world uh, to learn the, um, the flags. Uh, I'm explaining also uh, if she knows people from this country that this is the flag of this country and which language they, they talk. So it's a good way to use football to open the eyes of kids. Nice. And lastly, what did you do in your previous life before your 14 year career in finance? Well, um, actually I was DJ. Um, I did like eight years uh, DJ for weddings, anniversary, um, business events uh, because my dad was also doing that so it was a good way to to make money uh, and uh, and actually have fun <laughs> while doing money but uh, it's it's quite a heavy uh, work like we only see the party but the DJ needs to be there uh, at the beginning needs to be there at the end to to tidy up needs to prepare the party with uh, people so prepare songs and um yeah, but it's a fun way to um, to meet new people and uh, yeah, to make sure that people have fun and uh, one of the best day of their life. No, nice. So on that on that very high and happy note, uh, we will stop here again. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you Nicholas for taking time out of your day to speak uh, to our viewers, and we hope to see you guys very very soon. And have uh, happy holidays as well, and happy closing. Thank you. Bye.
Bye.